there any fraction challenges in the spell work? Yeah. I guess this one has, you know, a fraction in it. But, you know, the favorite um, part of yesterday's lesson was the fraction challenges. So maybe I'll add one to this. Um, All right, number one, I'm going to test out each value in the replacement set and uh, determine what n could be. So I'm going to test n equals 11. 11 plus 10 equal 23. Does 21 equal 23? No. Nope. And 11 doesn't work. So now I'll test out. Does n equal 12? No. Is 12 plus 10 23? Is 22 23? No. 12 doesn't work. I'll keep going through the list and I'll test 13. Is 13 plus 10 23? 23 equals 23, yes. If you showed any less words, you're not doing what I'm asking you to. All right, this isn't about the numbers. It's about the process. Yeah, it's the process. Unless you're practicing a process so that when the numbers do get more difficult, you have a skill set in place. All right, number two, let's test out some numbers. Our equation is 3 times x minus 7. I'm going to test um, x equals 11. I'm going to test x equals 12. I'm going to test x equals 13. Is the answer x? Okay, can I get a volunteer to come up and show the work for 11, Tony? 12? You're the one that can't write. I, I, I got it. I'll use my right here. She already pulled out. I'll use my right here. I'm hoping to get lots of different volunteers. But you just you can try plugging in 10 here, try plugging in 15, try plugging in 20, and try plugging in 25. So um, if I need to divide by 10 to get 2, what number do I want up here? What number divided by 10 gives me 2? 20. 20. So I want a 20 up here. I already have 5. What should I put in for D? 15. 15 will do it. I don't have any fractions left. Let's do a decimal problem, okay? So this is number four right now. All right, let's do some decimals. Should we convert them to fractions or just do them as decimals? All right, if you want to convert them to um, fractions, you feel free. Um, we got four fifths here. We got what? That's um, five and one fifth. So 11 fifths. Right. I think it's 31. All right, so let's test out some decimals. 
I want to test x equals 1.2. So these are the numbers that go in the replacement set. It's a little bit blurry. I know. The equation is to assume 0 0.8 parentheses x plus 5 equals 5.2. And we're going to test 1.2. We're going to test x equals 1.3. We're going to test x equals 1.4. Text it. All right. Um, is there anybody else that wanted to earn some extra credit today? Somebody else. Mikhail, which one do you want? 1.2? Okay, um, okay, in the back is it Kalia? Um, you got 1.3. You're done? Okay, did you want to compare this? Okay, did you want to come up 1.4? Yeah. All right, so here um, we tested 1.2. Did anybody else um, for the 1.2 get 4.96 does not equal 5.2? Um, did anybody test 1.3 and get 5.04 does not equal 5.2? Yes, we got to confirm on that. Okay, can anybody test um, 1.4 and get 5.2? Does that equal 5.12? All right, did anybody test 1.5 and get the answer? This is the answer, I'm done. I mean, I can do like that one for no. That looks great. All right, let's go over homework. Does anybody have a question? What you put for this one? So on the back of the handout, it's called relations. The front of the handout was called equations. The back of the handout is called relations. So this is chapter 1-6, relations. So um, today we're mostly working with ordered pairs. You know, you plotted ordered pairs on your pretest. You um, I believe you identified which quadrant ordered pairs would fall in. You got your x comma y. Today we're gonna look at these ordered pairs. We're gonna put them in tables. Let's label this. This is called the table. Um, this one is called the graph, which you know. And over here, this is called a mapping. Raise your hand if you've seen a mapping before. Very good, very good. A mapping, those two little like um, rectangles that have soft corners. All right, so we're gonna take these four ordered pairs and we're gonna re represent them in different ways. Start with the table, push your ordered pairs into the table. You know that points um, are x comma y. So um, our first point, x is 4, y is 3. Negative 2, negative 1, 2, negative 4, 0, negative 4. Can you pull that door shut until it clicks? Oh, I think it did. Try it out. Yes, thank you. All right, so go ahead and, and plot your points. You can kind of peek over um, at, the, at the people in your group or you can peek up at mine and just make sure your points fall in the right place.
Over four and up three is my first ordered pair. Negative two, negative one, two, negative four, zero, negative four. Do your dots match mine? Yes. Okay, um, so I want to give you a definition here for this little domain is the set of x values. Sophia, what's range? Um, oh, you're thinking of the highest minus the lowest. Somebody else in Sophia's group, go ahead. Go ahead. Definition of range. Logan? Oh, you got it. You got it, Benjamin. Go ahead. No. No, that's a different range. Um, Dominic. No, Tony, Tony. Okay, okay, no, 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 but I, I do want to say, Dominic, you're right, and I hear so many of you, range has two meanings in mathematics. So one of the meanings is the highest number minus the lowest number. So that's that's a good definition for range. I want you to hold that. This is the secondary use of the word range. Range is talking about the set of y values. If you look at this board, So um, let's do our mapping. So I'm going to put in, I'm going to put in four, negative two, two, and zero. I put the X's in the domain part. And then I put the Y's in the range part. And then for a mapping, just like, um, you know, a map actually is a, you know, where the car drives or where you walk, we're going to draw an air, uh, a line from the domain that pairs with that range. So four was paired with three, negative two was paired with negative one, two is paired with negative four, and so is zero. So there's one rule about um, mapping, and the rule is that you don't wanna write the same number twice. So let me just do like a, a great big arrow here. We're going to put a rule for mapping and um, generally for domain and range. Do not list the same number twice. Um, in the domain or in the range, do not, no, 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 like twice in one box. Okay. So I could have 
negative 4 here and negative 4 here. What I don't want is negative 4 listed twice here in the range. Like the line has to go to it twice. And this tells us that the y value negative 4 um, has two different x's that go to it. And that shows up right here. Those, those points line up horizontally. Uh, okay, and then down here right here, there's us to this domain and range. I just do like a great big D, and then I'm going to do a fancy bracket. And then I'm going to make a list. And then over here in uppercase R, fancy bracket, and make a list. And again, I'm not going to list that negative 4 twice. Just going to put it as a list. So you guys go ahead and, um, yeah, let's talk about how to draw that bracket. It's a parenthesis. It's like a, a point. So do a parenthesis, a point, and a parenthesis. That's a fancy bracket. This is it. Yeah, for this, yeah, fancy bracket. Don't put these in parentheses. Put them in fancy brackets. No, right. everyone can do it. I'm not going to sit here and say that none of you are capable of doing a fancy bracket. Everyone's capable. All right, do the next one, you guys. Go. Ready, go. Yes, yeah, same thing, round two. Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and say this is example one and this is example two. Do the table, do the graph, do the mapping, do the domain and range. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's get into it. I can't wait to find out. The math cops. I'm not writing. It's us. It's literally over there. What are we going to do? Oh, uh, Does anybody have any questions? I walked around and see the uh, majority of you are, are ready to move on. Okay. So let's talk um, independent and dependent variables. So something that's independent is um, something that's generally out of our control. Um, some good 
examples of independent variables, um, time is almost always independent in a problem. Like, we haven't figured out how to stop time. You know, I couldn't say that. Um, you know, I walked into the ice arena and it was really cold, so it became winter outside, right? It's not how it goes. Like, the clock and the calendar are kind of independent of, of no matter what. I can't say I, sh I shot off a bunch of fireworks and I made it the 4th of July, right? You can't change the dates. So time is technically um, generally independent from anything um, that's going on. What else is kind of usually independent um, something that's kind of out of our control. It doesn't matter what's going on. It's going to happen anyway. Mikhail? The weather is almost always the independent variable. Growth. A aging and growth. Um, there is a lot of, like, height questions, so that's that's actually a really good one. Um, so dependent variables. Money. Money is often dependent on how much of a, of an, of thing that you buy. Money is often an independent variable. It depends on how many you buy um, as far as how much you spend. Anybody else have a good example of something that's generally a dependent variable? We'll come up with more. We'll come up with more. Distance equals rate times time. Like distance is often dependent on how fast you go. Okay, here we go. Identify the independent and dependent variables. So in warm climates, the average amount of electricity used rises as the daily temperature increases and falls as the average um, temperature decreases. So there's um, an independent variable and a dependent variable here. Dependent. Okay, so um, now if I decide to use a bunch of electricity in my house, is the temperature of Florida going to be affected? No. Now, this is a little confusing though because we climate change, like if all of Florida did it, are we going to affect the climate? Yeah, so that's, uh, but that's complicated. So um, independent would be the temperature outside. And what's dependent is the amount of electricity we're using. So here in Manatee County, our electricity rate depends on how hot it is outside. When it's really hot outside, we need a lot of electricity in our grid. The people that run the electricity and the power department, they're working really hard over the summer because every building is really running their electricity. However, in the winter, some of us turn our AC off and open our windows and that power company doesn't have to use as much electricity. So the amount of electricity depends on um, how hot it is outside. Um, it, it changes um, no matter what we do as humans. Like we can't, we can't affect the temperature outside. There's this whole, like, you know, climate change argument, but we're saying, like, generally, um, what we do day to day, year to year, isn't going to all of a sudden make it freezing cold outside. We can't do that. All right, um, let's just head down here to this B problem. I'm here next. I'm here next. The number of calories you burn increases as the number of minutes you walk increases. Capital I for independent, capital D for dependent. All right, the number of calories I burn today depends on how long I walk. Okay, if I walk a lot, I'm going to burn calories. If I sit still, I'm not going to burn as many calories. The number of calories I burn depends on the number of minutes I walk. Okay. All right, um, let's go to the next one. So I'm coming up here to letter A. 
the air pressure inside a tire increases with the temperature. This is this is interesting to me because I drive, but cars now will put up a little light when your air pressure changes. And they didn't used to do that. We didn't used to know if the air pressure was changing. But now there's a computer sensor in there. So in the winter, when it actually gets cold here, you'll see more people at the gas station putting air in their tires because the air kind of, um, you know, when it gets really hot, the air gets gaseous and things evaporate and the molecules expand. When it gets cold, the molecules come together. So the tires actually get a little bit flat. So in the winter, people will be filling up their tires more than they do in the summer. So the air pressure depends on the temperature outside, okay? If I went to a junkyard and I saw a bunch of flat tires, does that mean it's cold outside? No, that's a junkyard. But if it's cold outside, tires are definitely going to be a little bit more flat because the air condenses. So my independent variable is temperature. And my dependent variable is air pressure. And you learned that in science class back when you learned the water cycle. The amount of water evaporating depends on the heat in the air. All right, um, as the amount of rain decreases, so does the water level in the river. Does anybody think they can do this one? You go ahead, Kata. Yes, get down. Okay, if, if there's not much rain, there's not much water in the river. However, could someone pump that water out? If someone were to go pump a bunch of water out of the river, would it act, would it definitely rain? No, the water level doesn't affect the rain. The rain affects the water level. All right, you guys, um, here's a little challenge. Um, what's happening here? The graph represents the temperature in Miss Ling's classroom on a winter day. I want you to think about, um, like, if, if well, if, wait, it's really cold outside. Let's say it's like, you know, one of those days where it's like actually 40 degrees outside and we got the heat on. What's happening here um, throughout the classroom? But why, though? Michelle? That's true. That's what I see. Anybody um, can figure out why that might happen in a classroom? People are entering and exiting this classroom. So, like here, everyone comes in and everyone's in here. It gets kind of hot. I'm going to stand with my door open. It gets going to get kind of cool. Everybody comes in and gets hot again. I'm going to stand with my door open. It gets cool. Also, does anybody know how, like, the thermometer on a, on a heat works? Like, so I'll set it to 70. It's cold outside. The heat will run until it gets to 70, and then the heat turns off. And then when the heat realizes, oh, no, it's less than 70, it kicks back on again. And that's how your AC is working, too. If you see, are your parents hitting that AC button all day long at home? Turn it back up and turn it back down, kind of making it catch up. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and put this. Um, so you guys decide. So maybe the door is opening throughout the day. Or maybe another idea is the heat is kicking on and off based on the temperature sensor. So guys, is the heat dependent on the temperature in the room? The, the actual machine is dependent on the temperature in the room. The temperature in the room goes down, the machine turns on. Temperature goes up, the machine turns off. So the machine depends on the temperature. The temperature is independent. Did we put temperature independent? Oh yeah, we put weather. All right, your assignment's on the backboard. Please use the rest of class to work on it. Oh, one minute.